So today I'm just going to uh, sum up uh, my uh, PhD related work uh, in these slides. Um, I try to be as organized as possible, but so if you find any, anything that's um, um, uh, suspicious or questionable, um, just feel free to ask. Um, so over the past years, uh, we've seen that AI is beating the best humans um, in lots of tasks. So for example, as early as 96, 97, um, we've seen uh, Deep Blue is playing against uh, Gary Kasparov, is able to uh, beat him. And the recent news comes uh, that uh, AlphaGo is able to master the more complex game Go and being able to beat uh, the world's uh, top one player. Um, so is AI going to um, solve everything um, for uh, every task? Um, so let's take a look at how the current AI is doing for understanding images. So if we just take uh, the same image that Gary Pas Kasparov is playing against the Deep Blue. So as human beings, uh, we can easily come up with uh, a caption like this, uh, like Russian chess player Gary Kasparov is playing against um, computer program Deep Blue. So we implicitly do the reasoning, like if, even if we do not recognize the face of Gary Kasparov, uh, we are able to infer that, okay, he's probably from Russia, uh, judging from the uh, flags here. Uh, his name is probably Gary Kasparov uh, from the background text, um, and probably he's a master of um, the game chess. Um, and we can do the same reasoning uh, for um, the computer program uh, Deep Blue. Uh, so for example, um, we have the common sense that, okay, for the game chess, probably we need two players um, to play the game. But on the image, there's only one player, then um, we see the computer monitor, and we know that this monitor is part of a computer. Um, and the computer program can actually act uh, as another player for the game. So somehow things are connected together um, to help us to understand the image. But if we slow the same image um, to the online image tagging system, uh, Clarify, one of the state of the art, um, the, the result it can return is something like this. For example, um, it understands there's uh, people there, um, there's competition going on, but uh, clearly it's missing a lot of details. And if we directly ask a computer to shoot for, uh, uh, for a caption, um, so here is a caption it can generate. Uh, uh, it's also from one of the state-of-the-art uh, systems. Um, it says I'm not really confident, but I think it is a man holding uh, a cake. Um, so this is where we are now, and clearly there's a gap between um, the captions or, or the understandings that a computer can generate and um, the, the captions or descriptions that um, humans are able to um, generate. So how can we close this gap? So to me, um, there are two important steps. So the first step is uh, we may want to have a dense understanding of images, um, recognizing uh, more categories um, than what we currently are. So for example, um, the current detection system uh, probably have, uh, has uh, the list of concepts like person, monitor, table, but without knowing that this is a chess board, uh, we cannot even uh, um, tell that uh, this is a chess game. So the second step, uh, is more important to me is uh, being able to reason with the parts of the pieces uh, um, we can understand about the image. So for example, um, from the flag, from the text, and from the chess pieces, we can get uh, the Rush chess master, um, Gary Kasparov. Um, and with uh, the, probably the logo at the back and, and the computer monitor, we can get something like uh, the computer program Deep Blue. So my thesis research can be exactly divided into these uh, two parts. So the first part is we want to have uh, a dense understanding to expand the vocabulary of, uh, of uh, um, our current system. And the second part is uh, how we can uh, 
find the relationships between um, different concepts, different parts and pieces in the image, and do reasoning uh, with them. And note that this is not actually a step one, step two thing. Uh, there are actually loops between them. So for example, uh, from the left side to the right side, uh, if we know more and more uh, uh, things about the visual world, uh, we can probably uh, connect more and more things together. And in return, if we uh, uh, learn uh, uh, a graph structure or uh, learn the relationships between concepts, it can probably uh, help us uh, uh, when we uh, learn new concepts. Um, so this, uh, this loop actually motivates us, uh, this is the major motivation for us to uh, build a lifelong learning uh, machine, uh, for, uh, particularly for vision. So in 2013, uh, we built one of the first system, actually the other system is probably here, uh, uh, to understand uh, uh, our visual world uh, from the web uh, by iterating uh, uh, between expanding vocabulary and relationships. Um, so the first part is expanding the vocabulary. Um, the traditional methods, uh, I think people have talked about all the time, is that uh, we use human intelligence uh, to expand the vocabulary. So people go to Mechanical Turk or develop self-contained system like Label Me. Uh, to label images. Um, but is this approach scalable? Um, so the uh, classical example is for the largest data set, ImageNet, there are millions of boxes annotated over a five year period, and it's about thousands of classes. Um, this is already impressive, but compared to um, the uh, images we can see uh, uploaded and, and people uh, take every day on our social media is actually pretty um, small. And we can have up to millions of tags, uh, according to some study here, uh, that can be used to uh, describe or tag images. So our approach is, uh, uh, is simple. Uh, we want to look at an alternative way uh, to uh, solve this problem. So, we resort to uh, World Wide Web Internet um, to uh, get onward dense understandings. So the basic pipeline is something like this. Uh, we have uh, a concept we want to learn, like chess. We go to um, Google or Flickr. We download a bunch of images. And hopefully, some magic happens that uh, it builds a, a classifier or detector for this concept. and um, it can successfully generalize um, to example like this. So in order to do that, uh, we want to take a closer look at uh, how we can actually build uh, a detector out of uh, those images. So the state-of-the-art detection system can be consisted of two parts. So the first part is uh, the features, um, which is becoming more and more important um, over the years. So the, the basic idea is um, you train uh, a large model on some other task, like ImageNet, um, and you get the feature representation, uh, somehow stores the knowledge uh, from ImageNet. And then um, another thing is uh, probably it requires location boxes uh, uh, for some particular end task. Um, and uh, traditionally, these detectors are trained uh, using human annotated boxes. So then our task becomes how we can actually uh, use web images to provide both features and location boxes uh, for, uh, for our task. <coughs> so the first part is visual features from the web. Uh, So the basic setup we have is uh, we have a list of concepts. Uh, we borrow the ImageNet uh, list, and we also have uh, object and uh, attribute listed from our previous work. Um, so in total, there are 2,300 uh, concepts. 
So we use this concept as uh, constant names as queries to query um, search engines. Um, and then we download images, uh, train an AlexNet, it's a basic uh, network, to predict the concept names. Um, and finally, we use um, the FC7 features uh, to train, at that time, the state of the art is called the region-based convolutional neural network, an RCN, um, to perform object detection task. Uh, and uh, we use all the boxes uh, inside VOC because right now our task is just focusing on features, not uh, uh, on the box itself. So we use the human annotated ones and we measure it with mean average pre precision, uh, the larger the better. So the base, baseline we have is uh, a network trend on uh, ImageNet. Um, it gives uh, 44.7 mean average precision uh, without fine tuning uh, the bottom features. Um, so our first attempt is to uh, train uh, the detector, uh, uh, train the uh, features directly. Uh, so our uh, motivation at that time is to uh, have data as close as distribution as possible uh, to our end task. So our uh, chosen one is uh, Flickr images because most of the VOC images are actually collected from uh, Flickr search engines. So if we directly train this uh, feature and apply it to uh, VOC um, detection, uh, the performance is, we could get is 38.1. Sig not only significantly lower, than the image net one, uh, but also uh, lower than the uh, network trained from scratch. So random initialization of the weights um, still getting better than uh, uh, our features. So clearly, uh, there's something uh, wrong there. Mm. Uh, this is a bit confused. So you train this on Flickr images, but just apply them in test set of VOC? Uh, we, 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 we train the features uh, from the web, from here, uh, from the Flickr images, and then uh, we train uh, SVM on top of it uh, using the, uh, yes. And that apply that SVM on the test set of uh, VOC? Yes, uh, apply it on the test set of a VOC object detection. So those numbers are all VOC numbers, by the way, yes? Hmm? These numbers are being average precision of VOC. of VOC. Yes, it's 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 significantly lower than the numbers yeah. you usually see right now. But uh, at that time, it was yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so our key observation, try to solve this task, is uh, uh, we see that Flickr images are actually uh, quite difficult um, to uh, converge the network. It has some, some weird or non-canonical uh, viewpoints, and there's always a background uh, in the image. But there's another uh, easy set of images online, uh, we call it Google, uh, that uh, the objects are usually centered. Uh, we usually find clean or simple background. Uh, uh, and we see these two types of data are actually complementary to each other. Um, and it would be good to use both of them. So our next uh, trial is to just augment the original Flickr images with Google images. And this does give us better performance uh, combining uh, Google and Flickr. It's actually very close to the one uh, we get uh, by training from scratch on VOC. So just out of curiosity, uh, we tried to train a Google Net uh, I mean, a network on Google Images alone. Um, and this actually gets better performance um, than combining and Google and Flickr images. Um, so it's always uh, the VOC test object detection MAP. Yes. 
Yeah, so uh, our observation is probably like Flickr images are quite noisy, and the the images I show, uh, they are probably more difficult to train with. So the network uh, sees that distribution, but uh, initially it cannot go and, uh, I mean, or maybe it's distracted by, by the noise in that distribution. Um, in fact, uh, Uh, I mean, the data is significantly less. So I doubt the performance is probably going to be lower. Um, but I'm not sure, like, if probably if you can take millions of images for just those VOC 20 classes. Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I haven't done experiments. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, in return to the distribution question, we actually, uh, 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 did the experiment that using the features of VOC, I mean, okay, first using pool five feature, um, and then uh, use that to find the nearest neighbors of, uh, of uh, Pascal images to uh, the Flickr images or the Google images. Actually, the Flickr ones can generate better uh, nearest neighbors in terms of distance, but yeah. Um, so, Still, there's a distribution problem. So uh, to, to see whether we can actually uh, close a gap between distributions, uh, we did the experiment of first train on Google uh, images and then fine tune it on Flickr images. And this gives us some uh, marginal um, improvement over just a train on Google alone. Um, so it does seem like the, the, the distribution can get closer um, and improve the performance, but um, uh, we suspect that there's a still noise in, in the Flickr ones and the, the improvement is not significant. So how can we do better? Um, our final approach is uh, actually a system try to uh, uh, compact the noise uh, in the Flickr images. So our idea is that uh, we train the Google um, uh, image, uh, network on Google images um, um, the same way we did. And then we fine tune it on Flickr images. Um, but at the same time, we put a graph on top of it to encode the high order um, statistics, high order relationships um, between um, objects or concepts. And then we define a loss, um, something like this, but the intuition is that uh, if uh, the network, uh, when it's fine-tuned on Flickr, uh, it makes uh, laughable or uh, uh, big mistakes, like confusing cat with bus, the penalty is larger. Uh, if it's confusing uh, cat with similar categories like tiger, um, the, the penalty is lower. So instead of this one hot uh, uh, ground truth, we actually smoothed it uh, with uh, um, high order uh, relationships. But how can we actually get this uh, relationship graph? Uh, we actually just use the confusion matrix of, of the uh, network uh, trained on Google images. So uh, here is a visualization. Uh, on the top row is uh, the categories we have. And uh, the bottom ones, bottom four, are actually the most confusing categories for each of the category. So you can, and, and this going from left to right, the accuracy uh, decreases. So you can see that uh, for birds, for some bird, it can do really well, but when it makes mistakes, uh, it's confusing between similar categories. Um, and even for uh, the bottom, like uh, worst performing categories, uh, like bossa nova, it is able to make some sense of it by connecting it to um, musical instruments or musical uh, magazines. So, yes. Our final approach can get us to uh, performance similar to ImageNet. Um, this is without fine tuning. Uh, we also show examples, uh, uh, show results with fine tuning features on VOC. So, previously it was fixed FC7, right now it's uh, fine tuning everything. So the performance gets better than the, uh, the previous numbers. 
Um, but our performance is actually roughly the same. On VOC 2007, ImageNet is better. On 2012, uh, ours is slightly better. And an interesting fact uh, here is that uh, if we just train the Google Net, uh, I mean, the network trained on Google Images, uh, after fine tuning on Flickr images, uh, the, the performance is actually very close to our final performance. So uh, it does seem like with Pascal VOC, uh, the, uh, uh, the data set, uh, we can, and, and if we fine tune it uh, end to end, uh, the performance uh, is uh, actually very close. Um, yes. Do these results hold across different network architectures? So we tried to uh, train the VGG16 architecture. Um, uh, the results somewhat hold, um, but uh, we didn't do the complete exper experiment uh, for that. Um, yeah. Um, so the second part is uh, how we can get location boxes uh, from the web. Um, so the motivation for that is web images, once we get from the web and there's no location information, uh, oh, why is this? Um, and of course, it has noise if we scroll down, scroll down. Um, and um, there's also a problem of polysemy. Like if we want to train for a concept like Apple, uh, probably um, it will wind up training a mixed detector for Apple the company and Apple the fruit. So in order to handle that, uh, at that time we come up with an algorithm called subcategory discovery. Uh, so the major motivation for that is um, even though we have seen a set of noisy images, there are images that are good, uh, like in these red boxes. And our goal is to um, dig out those uh, good images and use these images as a seed uh, to propagate um, the good signals. <coughs> so when we train it, um, we use an exemplar detector. The idea is just use one image as a positive, everything else as a negative. Uh, <coughs> and then we file it on the rest of the images to find the nearest neighbors. Um, and for good images, like the top two, uh, we can find good ones. It gets good support from the set. But if there's too much variation as a background or it's simply noise, uh, the pattern is not significant enough to support uh, the exemplar detector. So we can somehow set a threshold uh, and uh, only keep the good ones as seeds. And then we uh, connect uh, the, the uh, uh, the detect and the detections together using an affinity graph. So here, each detection is a node, and the detections that share a detector uh, are connected together. So this affinity graph already gives us some good uh, clustering properties, like uh, the front views or maybe this 45 degree views uh, are uh, tightly connected together. So we can run any kind of clustering algorithm on, on it. Um, to get subcategories or visual um, clusters. So we tried it um, initially with uh, the hog features, histogram or oriented gradient. Um, and here are the uh, results for NeoGuy. Um, it captures different viewpoints. Um, this is also this classic example of um, being. Uh, and um, later, we also tried to um, train on uh, the features we have trained uh, from the web, the FC7 features. Um, for most of the categories, we see that um, the features are more like, corresponding to more of a high level uh, semantics. Um, it can capture uh, viewpoints or maybe multiple uh, people can occur, multiple horses can occur um, uh, in the same same pattern. Um, so finally, once we have uh, the features and uh, the location boxes, we can train object detectors uh, from the web uh, with the web images only. So now we completely get rid of human annotations uh, and train detectors. 
So we have three setups. So first the set setup is um, just basic, whatever we have, the subcategories uh, we discovered, uh, we uh, put that for training. Uh, the second one we actually augmented uh, with more data. So the way we did it is we use uh, some um, object of proposal method that propose uh, boxes that are likely to contain uh, generic objects. And if we see that those boxes are overlapping with our discovered subcategories, we add that to the training set. And the third one is uh, similar to the idea of uh, 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 the previous fine-tuning uh, networks, uh, we actually added more related categories. So here, if we want to train a, um, a detector for Alpaca, we can add images um, for Llama there. And um, the final result we can get is uh, probably around 24. Um, and we see that adding more data uh, does not seem to help much at that time. And adding more categories definitely helped um, in our case. So our final performance is probably halfway there uh, compared to a network uh, uh, trained fully with uh, ImageNet and uh, ImageNet pre-training and Pascal uh, fine-tuning with all the human labels. Um, yes. So. We have two extensions um, for, the, for the previous work. Uh, so the first extension is uh, we just extend the previous boxes we have found, the subcategories, uh, with picosol level annotations. So the way we did is um, um, something like a graph cut with uh, priors uh, built from these uh, aligned classes. So the second extension we have is with the motivation that um, uh, the previous uh, algorithms we can have um, do give us the subcategories, uh, or we call it visual senses on the right here, but it has nowhere to know that, no way to know that the top three actually correspond um, to one semantic meaning and the bottom two correspond to um, the chain restaurant, the, uh, another semantic meaning. So in this extension, we actually try to do joint clustering with uh, semantic senses and visual senses. And uh, the way we do it is not only do we download uh, images from the web, but also uh, download text uh, surrounding that images and build models uh, for the text uh, side as well. And here is a visualization of um, the, the semantic senses we have. Um, so now I'm going to tell uh, more about the relationship and the reasoning part. And this is a part I'm more excited about um, these days. Um, so just to remind you um, why relationships are important. So first, it's uh, helping single image understanding. So for example, if uh, one recognizes a monitor, uh, it can be connected uh, to the concept of computer because we have this uh, relationship or com common sense that a uh, monitor is a part of a computer. Um, the second one uh, we've seen already is that um, relationships can probably uh, also help us uh, when we uh, go from uh, one type of a data to another of data to uh, constrain the high order uh, statistics. But how do we acquire relationships? Um, uh, the classical example uh, people usually have is CYC. They spent years um, trying to write down uh, millions of rules. Um, but our question is, uh, they are still counting, probably. Uh, like how many actually, actually how many uh, common sense relationships are needed? How many are there? Um, and how um, they can be uh, used to help our current vision systems? So our idea is still um, pretty simple. We try to uh, go for uh, web for uh, help. So in 2013, we had this uh, um, old system called Never Ending Image Learning, uh, where we want to try to build the uh, world's largest uh, visual knowledge base from the web automatically. And uh, the most exciting thing 
um, to myself about uh, uh, Neo's knowledge base is that it not only just look at the uh, visual similar looking relationships. So it actually defines multiple types of relationships over a set of concepts. Uh, so for concepts, uh, we have three types. So first the type is object. Um, um, the second type is scenes, like uh, parking lot or raceway. And for attributes, uh, we have round shape and crowded. And then uh, we have uh, five or six type of relationships, uh, like object object relationship. So this one is like similar. It's similar looking uh, object, like uh, Corolla is a kind of a car. Uh, but more interesting things happen when uh, we go beyond that. So we have part, part autonomy uh, relationships. We also have object seeing like cars found in raceway. Uh, we have object attribute like wheel has run shape. And then seeing attribute uh, trading flow is crowded. So to sum up, we actually have uh, we divide the data we have into um, three types of concepts, and then uh, we build the relationships on top of uh, these concepts. So it's at least a richer set um, than just have similar looking uh, relationships. Um, so this is old, also an old uh, uh, pipeline uh, describing how Neo is at work. So it's like a relationship constraint um, semi-supervised learning framework. I'm just going to quickly go through this. Um, so the way we do it is we use the same subcategory discovery algorithm uh, we had. I just described it before uh, to find the subcategories. And then uh, we use the subcategories to train models. In 2013, we trained this deformable uh, part like model. And then uh, once we train the models for different categories, we use um, these models to find the relationships with lots of data. So uh, the concept that distinguishes Neo from other system uh, when it looks at relationships is the concept between microvision and macrovision. So microvision, uh, in order to do something, um, you may want to give uh, uh, a detailed pixel level understanding uh, uh, for the full image, try to understand the image at most. But in our case, we do not need to uh, uh, understand each and every image, each and every pixels. Uh, we actually uh, uh, refer to our concept called microvision. So the way we do it is we look at millions of uh, images at, at a large scale and try to extract uh, the common patterns uh, in the image. And there are common patterns uh, exist uh, because our visual world is actually consists of a lot of boring facts. For example, cars are found on the road or sheep is white. So uh, the actual way we did it with the uh, uh, learning relationship is try to is by building a core occurrence or core detection uh, matrix. So here in this matrix, uh, each entry actually uh, corresponds to um, a concept uh, and another concept, how a concept is related to another. Um, so for example, uh, we see that, okay, computer and the keyboard, they uh, occur a lot in one of these uh, entries. And according to the feature, um, the keyboard detector went to files, it files usually inside the box of a, a, a computer. So this gives us uh, some idea that, OK, keyboard is a part of a computer. So we do that uh, for uh, all, the, all the possible uh, categories. So here are some examples um, for relationships, like object-object relationship, um, uh, like airplane nose is a part of Airbus 330. Uh, and here, this is actually a mistake. Uh, it should be ambulance is a kind of um, van. Um, and object seeing relationships, uh, like helicopter uh, is found in airfield, or zebra is found in savannah. So actually, 
Um, I think the best performing uh, uh, relationships in this category is um, uh, whenever there is a, a, a location and a big site for the location. So here, uh, Leading Tower uh, is a unique one in the world um, in, in pizza. So once we've found these relationships, uh, we can go back, um, look at the new set of images, uh, and find new instances for each category. So uh, to do that, we use both the detectors we have trained and the relationships. So we make sure that okay, relationships can also somehow hold uh, when the uh, detectors fire. Um, and this got, gives us new instances. And once we have new instances, we can retrain the model. And once we have retrained the model, uh, we can again do relationship discovery and find new instances. Um, and this uh, closes the loop of our learning. Um, so here we show some qualitative uh, results of uh, how the relationship holds. Uh, helps or hurts. So the first example is, I think, uh, Abhidhan mentioned it uh, as well. Like we can uh, generalize uh, from uh, classical uh, cars to more like uh, um, super cars. Um, the second one is probably Egypt because it finds uh, the relationship between um, Sphinx and um, Egypt. So in later iterations, uh, Lots of images are actually about uh, uh, the closed, uh, close up uh, view of, uh, of Sphinx. Uh, so here I'm going to give a, 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 a failure case. Um, it's about trench. So initially it was uh, about this trench at the war, uh, something like that, mostly about things. But then later uh, it actually uh, generates to, uh, uh, to the, the trench coat style because it defines a relationship between um, the, the human body, a uh, person, and, and the trench. So uh, this is the most exciting part I want to talk about, is actually uh, we, we do realize Neil's relationships already, I mean, it's only six types, um, is still scratching the surface um, of learning the relationships. Um, so in order to expand that, uh, we actually did a study of um, how uh, uh, the current research lies in, uh, in the space of relationships. So at the origin, uh, this is what where neural networks do. They just give training examples and then uh, and associate associated the categories, um, just to train the hell out of it. But um, there are works uh, that try to expand uh, the relationship in, in the more complex or semantic domain. For example, um, you can realize that, uh, okay, computer, um, it has desktop computer, different types, and desktop computer actually has overlap between um, some brand like Alienware of, uh, of desktops. Um, but the most exciting uh, dimension I want to explore is about uh, the spatial relationships. So if we go uh, from our origin directly there, um, we can study the layouts of uh, computers. Probably uh, no, no. Uh, probably I'm, at least I'm not rich enough to buy multiple computers and do a layout. But the examples uh, are more practical when it comes, uh, when we study, uh, for example, layouts of cars on the street. So there's overlapping patterns between them. Um, and in the end, uh, I think our ultimate goal, at least for now, is probably to joint reasoning uh, with both the spatial and uh, the semantic uh, uh, meanings of objects, like boy per computer games here. Um, so I'm saying that Neo is uh, still scratching the surface because uh, most of the uh, categories, uh, most of the relationships it found is actually uh, um, leaning towards the semantic side. So only part of relationship or object uh, seeing relationship uh, is still scr is scratching the surface. So we want to push it 
to more like uh, how we can do instance level context reasoning uh, with the both spatial and semantical um, uh, relationships. But actually modeling uh, the relationship that contains the spatial fact is pretty uh, hard. So just imagine about uh, the relationship A is on B. Um, because our visual world is uh, uh, mapped um, from projected from 3D to 2D, the, box, the resulting boxes uh, for A and B uh, can be arbitrary. Um, and of course, there's also polysemy. And here, the polysemy is more serious uh, compared to uh, the nouns uh, we have seen before. Uh, actually, for example, for on, uh, when it combines the different uh, arguments or subject and objects, uh, it can uh, mean very different things. So my favorite example is people on bus. It's actually inside the bus, uh, not uh, on bus. Um, and even if we have models of relationships, we want to uh, hope that this modeling can generalize um, when we use it. Um, so for, for example, in this case, uh, we want to understand, OK, Gary Kasparov um, is a Russian chess master by looking at the different regions uh, in the image. So it's actually very challenging. Um, so our motivation to try to solve this problem is uh, actually um, from the state-of-the-art object detection um, system. Um, so for example, uh, fast RCN, uh, it's already one of uh, a pretty uh, uh, complex uh, type, is uh, actually extract one region. They call it a region of interest. And then um, uh, put it out there and only at, look at these regions uh, when um, they apply models on top of it. Um, to, uh, to do classification. And this uh, pipeline is pretty simple, but in fact, it does really well uh, when um, it's uh, uh, applied to real tasks. So for example, here uh, we see the ball is pretty small, but it can detect the ball with very high confidence. And on the right side, I think the traffic light, um, even for humans, by just looking at the context, is very hard. Um, but the network is able to nail it um, uh, with very high confidence. So we suspect the reason is that um, the network is actually very good at aggregating context or uh, reaching out to uh, pixels that beyond uh, the, the, the scope of the current object. Uh, basically, large receptive fields. So, our idea is, um, is simple. We just try to see whether ConvNet by itself can model the spatial relationships. Um, so our recent work, um, except to ICCV, was uh, try to do exactly that. Um, we want to have a memory. Uh, it's a spatial memory uh, to act as a pseudo image so that ConvNets can showcase its power to do context reasoning. So the basic pipeline is something like this. We have a spatial memory. Uh, initially, it's empty, or it's encoding the priors of where objects tend to occur. Um, and once it detects a person, um, it plays uh, the features uh, of that person into that particular location where it's detected. And when it detects something else, like a racket, it plays it in, in the location as well. And you can notice that there's overlapping between the person and the racket. And this is where learning can help. So it can learn to, uh, uh, to know what features to keep um, in that overlapping regions. And uh, after aggregation of uh, ConfNet, uh, our hope is that uh, this memory uh, after storage of the previous instances can be able to detect uh, um, the next instance. And this entire representation is optimized towards this detection task. Oh, OK. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through this uh, memory uh, 
uh, how, how it does. So with the fast start CN, this is just uh, an example. Uh, from images, we can get COM5 features. Um, and fast RCN does region proposal and the region classification. And with memory, uh, we can uh, do the context aggregation as well, and then uh, help both the region proposal and the region classification task. So note that this uh, pipeline is actually generic. So for fast RCN, it's two-step detection. Uh, we uh, have features for both steps but it can be uh, generalized to any arbitrary detector. So when it's enrolled um, for sequential detection, it becomes something like this. So we first have an empty memory with images. We do a detection, um, get something out. We select uh, the detected object to update the memory. And then uh, we use memory, update the memory and image to the detection again, and do that again. Uh, in, uh, in later steps. So the problem becomes how we can actually select the next region. So the heuristic is we just select the most confident one. So any foreground uh, object class uh, with the highest confidence, we select that. But sometimes it can cause problems, like the top detection we have on the right side is actually an error. So it can cause problems for later detections. So one of the uh, current work I'm doing is how we can actually learn to do sequential selection um, in a, a reinforcement learning framework. So as of memory update, um, uh, the steps are actually quite simple. So uh, given an image, uh, once it detects a person, it extracts the image features of that person. Uh, at the same time, we extract the memory um, to a canonical size as well. And the hope is that we can combine these two features together um, in, uh, in a later stage to update the memory. So this is the fixed size update uh, with image features. And in the end, we can place it back into the memory uh, with the inverse operation uh, of crop and resize. And note that uh, because we do not do maximum pooling uh, here uh, for region of interest pooling, uh, the information is not lost. Um, so there's no uh, max pooling. And as of features, we update. Uh, so going from uh, t to t plus 1 in the memory, uh, we actually put not only uh, the image features, so it consists of top down, like, OK, for this person, um, I place um, the category person um, as a top down information to update the memory. But also the bottom up. So uh, you have shown that the COM5 features um, to encode the details of the person, like uh, the pose of the person and things like that. Um, and together, they are used to update uh, the next memory uh, with a gated recurrent unit. So here I want to give two motivations about why uh, we want to do explicit reasoning. Uh, so the first one is uh, right now the object detectors still need to learn, uh, still need human help to deduplicate. So the classical task is called non-maximum suppression. So initially there are lots of boxes uh, they check the over pa overlapping patterns and find uh, the most uh, uh, confident one. But this approach can be uh, suboptimal um, because it's only looking at the overlapping patterns, not the pixels itself. Um, so with the memory, we can actually um, learn to du duplicate. And the, the reason is that once we have detected the person, we not only update the memory, but we also uh, remove the ground truth uh, of that person uh, so that in later stages, it does not, uh, uh, it's not strained to predict that person. Um, and OK, maybe this is too complicated. I, I, can, I can skip this. 
But the major uh, message is that in order to train the network, we actually have to uh, stop the gradient in later iterations to be back propagated to the image side uh, in order to make sure that memory is the one that helps uh, uh, later detections. Um, yeah. All right, so the second motivation we, want, uh, we have is uh, in order to uh, train a region-based traditional object detector, it's actually looking at classes in isolation, but our pipeline is able to look at the entire layouts of different object classes. So instead of just learning from the X to individual Y mapping on the left side, we can learn the statistics of Y to Y as well with this current framework. So here we just give some qualitative results. Um, so going beyond the non-maximum su suppression, we can see that detecting the same class of a sheep, uh, it can actually help uh, detecting other classes, uh, other instances of the sheep class. So the confidence actually gets boosted. And an interesting example we have is uh, uh, beyond single classes, we can do multi-class reasoning. So given the table and the cake, uh, the confidence of a horse living inside the cake and the a table actually goes down. Um, so overall, um, our latest results can achieve uh, around 39% 30 MAP uh, on a plan uh, ResNet 152 feature. All right, so to sum up um, and to look for the future, uh, uh, we have looked at uh, how we can train um, models at the origin, just looking at examples by expanding vocabularies. We also look at the relationships, uh, how Neo did, and how it actually helps uh, expanding the vocabulary in return. But for the future, we want to uh, build frameworks. So right now, it's planned spatial memory um, to reason uh, with uh, both spatial and semantics. Um, and as for application, uh, I have also done some caption generation task, which requires reasoning, uh, okay, which uh, needs uh, reasoning, uh, not just nearest the neighbors, um, to move forward. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I'm maybe running a little bit over time. Um,